Okay, so I am going to be doing a live stream for the first time in a very long time. And uh, I'm very grateful to all those who have showed up. Thank you very much. That's very encouraging. Um, I'm feeling my way through this. And I got to learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time. So if any comments pop up, it may take me a while to get to them. So please bear with me. My topic is uh, a big one. I'm going to be discussing the Temple of Solomon. And there are many important things that I want to alert you to up front. The Temple of Solomon had within it something called the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was stored. And that took the form of a 20 cubit dimension by 20 cubit by 20 cubit cube. And um, it was filled with darkness. And it was the home, the earthly home of the God of Israel. And the God of Israel proclaimed that he lived, or it lives, in darkness and is a God of darkness. It is a lunar deity of darkness. And uh, this very much becomes a part of Freemasonry, where they claim that they want to turn darkness into light. But their God is the God of light, Lucifer, who is a God of the darkness the light of darkness. So I'm going to go through and demonstrate. Let me uh, <laughs> sorry for my amateurish toothing pains as I learn this uh, process. Okay. So the Temple of Solomon was supposedly built by demons that Solomon had summoned because the god that Solomon worshipped was the satanic god of Egypt, Seth, who is a god of darkness and chaos. And a lot of this uh, is incorporated into Freemasonry. The Freemasons believe that they are the children of Cain and that Cain was um, the child of the serpent in the Garden of Eden and Eve. And they refer to Cain and to his descendants as the widow's son because the serpent and Eve uh, had to break up and the serpent disappeared and then Eve began her life with Adam. So they refer to themselves as widow's sons, meaning that their father is the serpent in the Garden of Eden, that their father is Samael. And uh, I have a couple of uh, very authoritative sources on this. And let's start off with one of the most famous, which is um, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. The true name of Satan, the Kabbalists say, is that of Yahweh reversed. For Satan is not a black god, but the negation of God. The devil is the personification of atheism or idolatry. This is similar to the Greek conception that evil is simply uh, deprivation of good. For the initiates, this is not a person, but a force created for good, so he's saying that Satan was created for good, but which may serve for evil. It is the instrument of liberty or free will. Chaos has absolute free will, and it enables individuals to separate from God and uh, manifest their own will and ultimately to become their own God. Satan is called the uh, great divider by the occultists. They represent this force which presides over physical generation under the mythological and horned form of the god Pan. Thence came the he-goat 
of the Sabbat, brother of the ancient serpent and the light bearer or phosphor, of which the poets have made the false Lucifer of legend. The apocalypse is to those who receive the 19th degree of Freemasonry, the apotheosis of that sublime faith which aspires to God alone and despises all the pomps and works of Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, it is he who bears the light. In other words, the light of darkness, not the daylight. And with its splendors, intolerable blinds, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls. Doubt it not, for traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations. And inspiration is not of one age, nor of one creed. Plato and Philo also were inspired. The Apocalypse, indeed, is a book as obscure as the Zohar. So the God of Freemasonry is Lucifer, the God of darkness. Freemasons conceive of themselves as the widow's son. In other words, the uh, descendant of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Another um, noted authority on Freemasonry was the Rosicrucian author, Max Heindel. And he wrote a great deal about these topics. And I'm gonna click through on what he had to say about Cain and Cain's being the child of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, Samael, and Freemasons viewing themselves as having obtained this wisdom and energy of Satan which enables them to create the uh, temple. The temple was built by the architect Hiram Abiff. He's called Hiram in the Bible, and the Freemasons refer to him as Hiram Abiff, and he's a, a very key figure in uh, Freemasonry. The Masonic legend has points of variance from as well as agreement with the Bible story. It states that Jehovah created Eve, that the Lucifer spirit, Samael, united with her, but that he was ousted by Jehovah and forced to leave her before the birth of her son Cain, who was thus the son of a widow. See how Cain is the son of the widow because Lucifer left Eve? Then Jehovah created Adam to be the husband of Eve, and from their union, Abel was born. Thus, from the beginning, there have been two kinds of people. In the world, one begotten by the Lucifer spirit, Samael, and partaking of a semi-divine nature imbued with the dynamic material energy inherited from this divine ancestry, is aggressive, progressive, and possessed of great initiative, but impatient of restraint or authority, whether human or divine. This class is loath to take things on faith and prone to prove all things by the light of reason. He is referring to the non-Israelites as opposed to the Israelites. And he will go on to explain that they represent the male aspect of humanity and the aspect of fire. The Israelites are descended from Seth, who inherited the soul of Abel, and they represent water and the female aspect of humanity. It is the male aspect, the non-Israelites, who become Freemasons and do all the work of destruction of the devil in order to create the world to come. This class is loath to take things on faith and prone to prove all things by the light of reason. These people believe in works rather than faith, and by their dauntless courage and inexhaustible energy, they have transformed the trackless wilderness of the world to a garden full of life and beauty, so lovely, in fact, 
that the sons of Cain have forgotten the garden of God, the kingdom of heaven, whence they were expelled by the decree of the lunar God, Jehovah. Jehovah is the moon, the black pig, the shadow on the moon. Jehovah is Shekinah, the female aspect of the Egyptian god Seth. Against him, they are in constant rebellion because he had tied them by the umbilical cable toe. I have a whole lot on that in my new book, uh, Satanic Secrets of Jesus Christ, Volume 3. They have lost their spiritual sight and are imprisoned in the forehead of the body where it is said Cain was marked. They must wander as prodigal sons in the comparative darkness of the material world, oblivious to their high and noble estate until they find the door of the temple and ask to receive light. Then as Freemason or children of light, they are instructed in methods of building a new temple without sound of hammer. And when they have learned this, they may travel in foreign countries to learn more of the craft. Such is the temperament of the widow's sons inherited from their divine progenitor, Samael, and given by him to their ancestor, Cain. This is absolute proof that the Freemasons consider themselves to literally be the offspring of Satan. And their chief goal is to help build the temple of Solomon because the temple of Solomon is a temple of Satan. Satan's ultimate goal is to destroy creation and humanity and replace it with his own army of 600,000 immortal androgynous souls of the Israelites. By arduous and energetic application to the world's work, the sons of Cain have acquired worldly wisdom and temporal power. They have been captains of industry and masters of statecraft like Trotsky and Lenin. Well, the sons of Seth, looking, for the Lord, looking to the Lord for guidance, have become the avenue for divine and spiritual wisdom. Remember that Solomon was married to wisdom. He was married to the daughter of Pharaoh and to the knowledge of the Egyptians, which is represented by his marriage to the tree of knowledge, which is expressed in the Song of Solomon, as I uh, proved in my previous video. They constitute the priest caste, craft, priest craft. And the Bible repeatedly states that uh, the Israelites will be the priests of the world and Esau will serve as their uh, slave class. About the future in store for the sons of Cain and their followers, the temple legend is also most eloquent. It states that from Cain descend Methuselah, who invented writing, Tubal Cain, a cunning worker in metals, and Jubal, who originated music. In short, the sons of Cain are the originators of the arts and crafts. Freemasonry is called the craft, as in the Demiurge. Therefore, when Jehovah chose Solomon, the scion of the race of Seth, to build a house for his name, the sublime spirituality of a long line of divinely guided ancestors flowered into the conception of the magnificent temple called Solomon's Temple. Though Solomon was only the instrument to carry out the divine plan revealed by Jehovah to David, but Solomon was unable to execute the divine design in concrete form. Therefore, it became necessary for him to apply to King Hiram of Tyre, the descendant of Cain, who selected Hiram Abiff, the son of a widow, as all Freemasons are called, 
because of the relation of their divine progenitor with Eve. That divine progenitor is Samael. This is express open confession that they believe themselves to be the children of Satan. Hiram Abiff then became Grand Master of the Army of Construction. In him, the arts and crafts of all the sons of Cain who had gone before had flowered. The sons of Cain descend from the fiery Lucifer spirits. The sons of Cain descended from the fiery Lucifer spirits were naturally proficient in the use of fire. Again, absolute proof that they believe they're descended from Lucifer. And yet they claim the highest moral authority, but they um, operate in absolute secrecy. In that ancient age, when Cain and Abel first found themselves upon earth, Abel contentedly cared for the flocks created like himself and his parents, Adam and Eve by uh, Jehovah. So Cain is the child of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are one being created by Jehovah that was split into its male and female aspects. Those male and female aspects discovered that they were sexual beings and could procreate, which was the wisdom that they received. But the wisdom that Cain received uh, was as described in terms of metallurgy, farming, all the things that Prometheus provided to humanity. But in Cain, semi-divine progeny of the Lucifer spirit, Samael, and Eve, the creature of Jehovah, divine incentive to original effort, burned. He tilled the field and made two blades of, gro of grass, it should be, grow where one grew before. The creative instinct must have expression. Hiram, being the focus of and having inherited all the crafts of Cain, was also invested with the spirit of Samael, intensified in commensurate ratio. Therefore, he was consumed by an overpowering urge to add something to the temple that would eclipse the rest of the structure in beauty and importance. Out of the travail of his spirit was born the conception of the molten sea. That's another very important element of the temple and of Freemasonry. And this great ideal he proceeded to carry into execution through though heaven and earth held their breath in awe at the audacity of his purpose. I'd like to point out now that one of the, another of the major crimes of Freemasonry, in addition to the world wars and uh, Bolshevism, Stalin, uh, not Stalin, but Trotsky and Lenin, um, Truman and many other prominent Freemasons, the uh, Dern May, Young Turks who perpetrated the Armenian Genocide were over 95% Freemasons, people who considered themselves to be children of Satan and carrying out Satan's edicts. And that's another one of the very important reasons why it's so uh, necessary for us all to understand this complex theology. We have already seen how Hiram Abiff, the widow's son, meaning that his father was Satan, or uh, he descends from Satan, left his father, the Luf Lucifer spirit, Samael, after the baptism of fire in the molten sea. Again, the Israelites are in the water. They are the female water spirit, the virgin, uh, daughters of the virgin mother. But the... Um, the Freemasons consider themselves to be baptized in the fire of the molten sea of Lucifer, in other words, in hell. And how he received the mission to prepare the way for the kingdom among the sons of Cain, his brethren, by developing their arts and crafts as temple builders, masons, and teaching them the preparation of the philosopher's stone or molten sea. Um, I'm going to take a look at the chat. Okay, we're good.
It will be remembered that according to the Bible, it will be remembered that according to the Bible story, the Lucifer spirit appeared to Eve as a serpent, a son of wisdom. Solomon is the son of wisdom. When God offered to give him whatever he wanted, Solomon requested wisdom. Solomon wed wisdom in the form of the Pharaoh's daughter by adopting the Egyptian worship of Seth. Um, Solomon utilized demons to construct the temple to Seth in Jerusalem when Seth elected to make the Israelites his chosen people because the Egyptians had abandoned Seth in favor of the true gods of light, Ra, Osiris, and Horus. And uh, the Israelites, um, mimicking the Hyksos from whom they believed they were descended, began to worship this god, Seth, and created the mythology that Seth wanted to move from Egypt to Jerusalem, have a new house built, a new temple built for himself in Jerusalem, and that he chose the Israelites to become his new people and then exterminated the firstborn Egyptians in favor of the secondborn Israelites, who then take the place of the Egyptians, inherit the Egyptian kingdom, inherit Seth's house, and uh, the Pharaoh then becomes Messiah, son of David. Cain, according to the Masonic legend, was born from this union with Eve. It is also stated that the Lucifer, Lucifer spirit then left Eve, who thus became a widow. And Cain was thus the son of the Lucifer spirit, the serpent of wisdom, and Eve the widow. That is why Freemasons refer to themselves as the widow's sons. They are proudly pronouncing that they are descended from the devil directly. And that their aim is to build a third temple to the devil. The origin of the temporal and spiritual streams of evolution is as follows. Jehovah created Eve, a human being. The Lucifer spirit, Samael, united with Eve and begat a semi-divine son. They view Cain as a demigod because he's descended from Satan and Eve. As he left Eve, before the birth of the child, Cain was the son of a widow and a serpent of wisdom. Then Jehovah created Adam, a human being like Eve. Adam and Eve united and begat a child, human like themselves, whose name was Abel. Jehovah being the lunar God. Jehovah is the God of darkness. Jehovah is the moon. This is satanic worship of the moon in the form of Seth as the black pig, the shadow on the moon. Is associated with water. Hence, there was enmity be between Cain, the son of fire, and Abel, the son of water. So Cain slew Abel, and Abel was replaced by Seth. Um, the noted Kabbalistic scholar uh, Isaac Luria stated that Seth inherited the soul of Abel and that Jesus inherited the soul of Cain. Since Cain is the widow's son, uh, the son of Satan, that makes Jesus the descendant of Satan. But he has a dual nature in that his mother was an Israelite and his father was the devil. But his, interestingly, his father was actually Lilith, the female aspect of the devil. In time and through generations, the son of Cain became the craftsman of the world. In other words, the demiurge of the material world of the earth. Skilled in the use of fire and metal, their ideal was male, Hiram Abiff, the master workman. The sons of Seth, on the other hand, became the churchmen, upholding the feminine ideal. They believed that they embody the spirit of Shekinah, the uh, moon goddess when the moon is in full glory of the full moon. Uh, Shekinah is revealed and she has been exiled as Israel was exiled and exists among the Israelites as their soul. The feminine ideal, the Virgin Mary, and ruling their people by the magic water placed at their temple doors. 
It's really Shekinah, not the Virgin Mary. Various attempts have been made to unite the two streams of humanity and emancipate them from their progenitors, Jehovah and the Lucifer spirits. This text is condemning non-Israelites to be the children of Satan. With this end in view, the symbolic temple was built according to the instruction of Solomon. The son of Seth and the molten sea was cast by Hiram Abiff, the son of Cain. But the main object was frustrated, as we have seen, and the attempt at unification proved abortive. Is it any wonder that these people who believe in this nonsense were capable of mass murdering 1.5 million Armenians and 50 million people in Eastern Europe? Uh, it's just, it boggles the mind that there's, there's such sickness in the world. As the creative energy implanted by their divine ancestor Samael, <laughs> they refer to Satan and his offspring. It just, it's, I wouldn't believe it if I weren't reading it myself. Cause Cain to work and originate. So this same spiritual urge prompts his descendants to work out their own salvation through the fire of tribulation and fashion for themselves the golden wedding garment, which is the open sesame to the invisible world of hell and complete separation from God. Okay, now let's get, um, let's get rolling on some uh, perhaps more interesting things. In the temple, there is this uh, structure called the Holy of Holies which housed the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had a mercy seat on it with the uh, winged angels and the spirit of Jehovah, the spirit of Seth. He's called Yahweh, Yao, because he's a donkey-headed God. And uh, the correct pronunciation is the brain of a donkey is his name. He appeared as a dark cloud. And uh, he stated that he lives in darkness. So he is the God of darkness. He is the devil. He is Seth, God of darkness and chaos. So we have this cubical structure, the Holy of Holies. Seth also proclaims that he is the rock. He's known as the rock of Israel. So if we take this darkness, this blackness, and combine it with this cube as a rock, we get black rock. And I think that is the ultimate source of why we are seeing so many black cubes around the earth. It is supposed to symbolize uh, Seth and the Holy of Holies and the fact that the God of Israel proclaims himself to be a rock and to live in darkness. And therefore, it is a black rock. It is a rock of darkness. It is the rock of the moon. And on earth, it takes the form of the Holy Holies as a cubical structure. It would not have made sense to uh, transform it into a sphere. They wouldn't have had the ability to do it. Um, there is a famous book which is attributed to Christians called the Testament of Solomon. It is translated in the Jewish Quarterly Review of October 1898. I just want people to be confident that these are all legitimate sources. The Jewish Quarterly Review, edited by I. Abrahams and C. G. Montefiore, probably related to the Rothschilds, Volume 11, London, Macmillan and Company. I'm going to wear my finger out on this mouse wheel. And this is. Um, the introductory remarks of the translator, which give a pretty good summary of the Testament of Solomon. The following is the drift of the Testament. King Solomon is engaged in the work of building the temple and in him dwells a supernatural power, the wisdom as in the wisdom 
that the serpent tempted Adam and Eve with from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Solomon imbibed in that knowledge. Christians imbibe in that knowledge, that wisdom, by consuming the Eucharist, which is the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge. Solomon was actually married to that forbidden fruit. And in the Song of Solomon, his wife describes himself as those fruits of the tree of knowledge. Pomegranates, uh, the grapevine, the apple, and the fig. King Solomon is engaged in the work of building the temple, and in him dwells a supernatural power, the wisdom, also called the glory, <clears throat> the excuse me, the spirit and glory of God. In virtue of the eminence in him of this power, Solomon has the power over the spirits of the air, of the earth's surface, and of the netherworld. In the uh, in Islam, he's said to have built the temple with jinn. According to the Christians, probably related back to a very old uh, Judaic oral tradition, it was noted that he commanded the highest demonic forces to build the temple because it was a temple to the devil. The Testament opens rather abruptly with the descent of the vampire spirit, Ornias, upon Solomon's servant. Solomon goes into the nearly completed temple and prays for the Lord for help to the Lord Sabaoth. Grace is granted him, and the archangel Michael brings him a ring of which the stone was engraved with a pent alpha. Pent alpha is a pentagram. Solomon bore a ring with uh, the satanic image of the pentagram. When you cut an apple in half, the seeds form a pentagram. When you cut a pomegranate in half, the seeds form a pentagram. Those were considered evil by the ancients, and that's why they're associated with the tree of knowledge and the forbidden fruit. This ring endows its possessor with power over all demons. This is where the uh, mythology of uh, Lord of the Rings comes from. Armed with it, Solomon calls up before him all the demons and asks each of them in turn his or her name as well as the name of the star or constellation or zodiacal sign and of the particular angel to the influence of which each is subject. One after another, the spirits are vanquished and compelled by Solomon to aid in the construction of this temple. Ornias is the first demon to appear and he is set down to hew stones. Next appears Beelzebul, Beelzebub, Prince, an exarch of the demons, who promises to parade before Solomon all his subject spirits and proceeds to do so, beginning with Anaskalus. Uh, remember that Jesus was accused of being related to Beelzebub and the prince of demons, and it was by his power that uh, Jesus was able to cast out demons. Asmodeus follows after Anaskalus and gives an account of himself which agrees with the book of Tobit. Beelzebul reappears on the scene and in a dialogue with Solomon, declares that he alone survives of the angels who, as Enoch declares, came down from heaven. He reigns over all who are in Tartarus <clears throat> and has a child in the Red Sea. Red Sea is very significant. Parting the Red Sea is opening up chaos. Um, Seth transferred his, his holiness from the Egyptians to the Israelites as an analog to crossing over the Red Sea. He transferred his capital from Egypt to Israel. The concluding incident of the Testament is Solomon's fall, lured by passion for a Shunammite woman. He sacrifices grasshoppers to Moloch. Forthwith, the Spirit of God leaves him, and he is weakened and builds temples to Baal, Raph, uh, Ramphan, and Moloch. 
Solomon um, angered Seth, not because he married uh, Pharaoh's daughter and brought over the wisdom of Egypt to the Israelites, but also because he had numerous foreign wives who um, did to Seth what the Egyptians had done to Seth, and they caused the Israelites to worship these other foreign gods, which made Seth jealous, just as Seth was jealous of Horus and Osiris and murdered Osiris when Osiris slept with Seth's wife, Nephthys. So this is a retelling of Egyptian history as if it were Israelite history. And that occurs again and again throughout the Bible. The Israelites pretend that they are reliving Egyptian history. The Egyptians had an upper and lower kingdom. The Israelites pretend to have an upper and lower kingdom. Uh, there are wars between Seth and Horus and Osiris, which play out as battles between uh, the patriarchs and the noted figures in um, Judaism. So Judaism is completely an analog trying to uh, appropriate and adopt all of Egyptian mythology as if it were Israelite mythology, just as Jacob takes Esau's firstborn birthright and blessings and his soul, the Israelites take over the gods, the history, and um, the prophecies of the Egyptians. So this is the uh, Wikipedia page on Solomon. The Hebrew Bible, <coughs> excuse me. The Hebrew Bible records that the Tyrians played a leading role in the construction of the temple. The second book of Samuel mentions how David and Hiram forged an alliance. This friendship continues after Solomon succeeds David, and the two refer to each other as brothers. This is like Cain and Seth acting as brothers and as the Freemasons working together with the Israelites to fulfill the will of Jehovah with um, the Freemasons playing the role as the descendants of Samael and doing all the dirty work and the Israelites sitting in their tents as the priests gaining, garnering all the benefits from what the um, Freemasons are doing destructively. And this also relates to the idea that before the uh, Israelites left Egypt, they claimed to have borrowed all of the gold, silver, jewelry, and clothing of the Egyptians and then stole it. So they are have a, a coded plan to always dupe the non-Israelites into serving them and to handing over all their treasures, riches, wisdom, gods, uh, kingdom. The kingdom from the Nile to the Euphrates was the Egyptian kingdom to which the Israelites then laid claim after they adopted Seth as the God of Israel, etc. Dedication, and this becomes important because this is absolute proof that the God of Israel is the God of darkness. He lives in a black cloud of darkness, which becomes the black rock of the Holy of Holies, the black cube signifying the moon as the domain of the God of Israel. He's a God of, she is a God of darkness and evil and not a God of daylight and beauty and truth. Dedication, 1 Kings, 2 Chronicles, recount the events of the temple's dedication. When the priests emerged from the Holy of Holies after placing the ark there, the temple was filled with an overpowering cloud that interrupted the dedication ceremony. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord such that the priests could not stand to minister. Solomon interpreted the cloud as proof that his pious work was accepted, his demonic pious work for the devil. 
The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. Their Lord, the God of Israel, is a God of darkness. And all this talk about darkness to light is destroying the daylight, absorbing its energy, and converting it to the light of darkness, the shining of the moon. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Another very important aspect of this for people to understand is that the Midrash and the Zohar explain that the moon exists, exists both at daytime and at nighttime. Therefore, the Israelites will exist in the present world and in the world to come. But um, the non-Israelites, particularly the Romans, worship solar deities. The sun only exists during the day and then disappears when it sets at night. So the non-Israelites will disappear from the present world, Olam Hazeh, and will not exist in the uh, future world to come, Olam Haba. Only the Israelites will survive the 6,000th year. The allusion is to Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to come just at any time into the sanctuary inside the curtain before the mercy seat that is upon the ark or he will die. For I appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. The pulpit commentary notes that Solomon had thus every warrant for connecting a theophany with the thick, dark cloud of the God of Israel. I hope that this um, impacts people in the same way that it impacts me. Why, why don't people realize, why don't Christians realize that this is the God of darkness? This is the God of the thick, dark cloud of blackness and chaos and nighttime. This is Seth, the Egyptian God of evil, who wants to destroy humanity. The ulam, or porch, featured two bronze pillars, Yachin and Boaz. Those uh, in Kabbalah become the two pillars of the Sephirotic tree, the pillar of mercy and the pillar of severity. Severity is transferred to the Gentiles through the sacrifice of the scapegoat, and in so doing, the Israelites obtain mercy from the Lord, the God, the cloud of darkness. The Holy of Holies is also called the inner house, was 20 cubits in length, breadth, and height. In other words, it is a cube, as in the cube of the black rock. It was floored and wainscoted with cedar of Lebanon, and its walls and floor were overlaid with gold, amounting to 600 talents, or roughly 20 metric tons. A lot of that gold was ripped off from the Egyptians. According to the Hebrew Bible, the molten or brazen sea, cast metal sea, was a large basin in the temple for ablution of the priests. It is described in Kings, 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. Until the reforms of Josiah, uh, he went around smashing all the idols. Hezekiah was another one who went around smashing all the idols. There was also a statue for the goddess Asherah, the queen of heaven, Shekinah, and priestesses who wove ritual textiles for her. Next to the temple was a house for the temple prostitutes who performed sacred prostitution at the temple. It is unclear whether the prostitutes included both male and female or just male prostitutes. I wonder if um, all these temple organizations that want to rebuild the temple are going to rebuild a house for sacred temple prostitution. And that is one of the reasons why we see pride parades in Jerusalem. Uh, perhaps this is uh, an attempt at sympathetic magic pre-programming to um, condition people to the idea that there will be next to the holy temple a place of sacred prostitution with male prostitutes. 
according to the and Christians believe that this is a holy temple for them. How do we get through to them the fact that they are worshiping demonic, evil things and have been duped into doing so? According to the majority of biblical scholars, Asherah was Yahweh's consort and she was worshipped alongside Yahweh. She was Yahweh's female aspect. She uh, becomes Shekinah. Although originally a symbol of the goddess, the Asherah is argued to have been adopted as a symbol of Yahweh. According to Richard Lowry, Yahweh and Asherah headed a pantheon of other Judean gods that were worshipped at the temple. Asherah, uh, according to the Kabbalists, separated from Yahweh in the same sense that Eve separated from Adam. They slept together in Solomon's temple when the temple was destroyed. She became angry and in exile. She now sleeps with Samael and she is part of the Jewish people and uh, represents their soul. Biblical scholar Francesca Stravrakopoulou states that Yahweh was physically enthroned above the ark as a cult statue, and it was only following the exile that Yahweh was conceived as unseen and the prohibition on carved images was added to the Ten Commandments that would fit in exactly with the ancients' accusations that they found uh, Moses riding a donkey or they found the head of an ass in the temple to represent Seth and the god Yao, the sound of a donkey brain. During the Deuteronomic reform of King Josiah, the cult objects of the sun and Asherah were taken out of the temple and the practice of sacred prostitution and the worship of Baal and the hosts of heaven were stopped. They were also sacrificing children in the temple, obviously. Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies, was the inner sanctuary within the tabernacle and temple in Jerusalem. When Solomon's temple and the second temple were standing, a brocade curtain made with cherubim motifs woven directly into the fabric from the loom divided the Holy of Holies from the lesser holy place. The Holy of Holies was located in the westernmost end of the temple building, being a perfect cube as in the black cube, black rock, 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. The inside was in total darkness, black rock, and contained the Ark of the Covenant, gilded inside and out, in which was placed the tablets of the covenant. According to both Jewish and Christian tradition, uh, Aaron's rod and a pot of manna were also in the Ark. The Ark was covered with a lid, made of pure gold known as the mercy seat, which was covered by the beaten gold cherubim wings, creating a space for the divine presence. The divine presence is a black cloud that lives in a black cube, signifying the rock of the moon. I'm going to go over the uh, biblical passages which prove that the God of Israel is thought of as a rock, as in the moon. Um, then spake Solomon, the Lord said, He would dwell in thick darkness. I have surely built thee an house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. He is the God of darkness. But his bow remained steady. His arm strong, stayed limber, because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, the black cube, the moon, the black rock. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Their God is a rock 
what rock could that be of a lunar deity other than the moon? The eye that um, Seth plucked out of Horus's head. The black pig. You who tear yourself to pieces in your anger, is the earth to be abandoned for your sake, or must the rocks be moved from their place? Let's look at what the Talmud has to say about that passage. This is uh, Berakot 5b, paragraph 26. Not only that, but it causes the divine presence to remove itself from Israel, as it is stated in the continuation of the verse, the rock will be moved from its place. The rock, God, is forced to remove his presence. And the rock means nothing other than the Holy One, blessed be he, as it is stated, of the rock that gave birth to you, you have been unmindful. You have forgotten God who bore you. They think that they have a right to both the present world and to a future world, the world to come, in which all non-Israelites will have been exterminated because they worship a lunar god. That is one of their justifications and pretexts for seeking the complete extermination of all non-Israelite humanity because the moon can be seen at daytime and at nighttime and that the non-Israelites worship a solar deity. That is the threat that we human beings face from these people. Um, I really don't know how to make it any clearer that we are in extreme, imminent danger of the eradication of humanity, the construction of a third temple to Satan in which the cloud of darkness, the black rock, the holy of holies of evil will reign over all future beings who will no longer be normal human beings. They will be derived from the DNA of the Israelites and reconstituted into the form of immortal androgynous beings as Adam and Eve are depicted in the Torah. We don't have to let them get away with it. If we can work together, build a community, we can inform other people of this imminent danger. This will help to explain to them why these insane events that we are witnessing before our very eyes are taking place on a daily basis. And perhaps we can start a movement to uh, rescue ourselves from all this because people will be able to recognize it and where it's headed. I want to uh, keep live streaming. I need your support. Um, thank you, Ali Abbas. The third temple will be built in Jerusalem or Egypt? That's a wonderful question. Thank you for your tip, Ali Abbas, and thank you for that marvelous question. That's something I've been pondering over for years. If you read Exodus, I think it's chapter 2, and uh, Isaiah chapter 19, especially Isaiah chapter 19, it implies that they're eventually planning to build a, their temple in Egypt. And I suspect that's the ultimate plan. After they have killed everyone else off, they can then pretend to be the Egyptians and take the place of the Egyptians and build their temple in Egypt. After all, all these great architects of the temple, the greatest architects in human history were the Egyptians. And if they want to pretend to be the Egyptians, they're probably going to build a temple uh, that mimics the temple architecture of the Egyptians. They're going to start burying their uh, Messiah son of David's in pyramids. And I think that they're going to try to um, 
obtain new flesh for their dry bones in mimicry of mummery. And um, they're going to try to become immortal, which was the quest of the Egyptians through mummification. And uh, one of the things that the Egyptians admired about mummification was that it turned the flesh black and they saw immortality as being akin to blackness and darkness. And they viewed the rich, dark earth of the Nile Crescent as the good black lands. And they viewed the red sands of the desert as the evil red sands of Seth and the red lands. And that's where this whole uh, mythology of the Edomites as the red haired people and of Esau as being born red as it states in Genesis comes from. Again, uh, very much of what is contained in the Torah mimics exactly the Egyptians in a codified form. And they learned uh, that they had to conceal the fact that they were worshiping Seth because the Egyptians had books of spells against Seth and against the uh, foreign invaders who worship Seth. And they feared that those book of spells would be imposed against them as they were by Antiochus Epiphanes IV and as Caligula planned to do. Those book of spells call for um, those who worship Horus, those who worship Apollo, those who worship Ra, the sun, to fight off those who worship the moon, darkness, and chaos, who worship Seth by sacrificing their holy animals, which in the case of kosher are the animals of Seth, the um, unclean, supposedly, animals of the pig and the serpent are actually the divine animals. And so the process of fighting back against Seth and the followers of Seth is to uh, desecrate their temples by sacrificing pigs and serpents in those temples and then forcing the priests of Seth to consume those animals and to give praise to Zeus or to the other uh, gods of goodness as opposed to the gods of chaos. But in answer to your question, I think they're going to first try to build a temple in Jerusalem. Uh, they're going to try to kill off the Amalekites, which will first be the Armenians, and then will be all non-Israelites. They will anoint their king, and uh, they plan over the centuries to then build the temple in Egypt. And I think that's their ultimate aim. And the proof I give of that is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 19. If memory serves me correctly, it would be verse 17. But don't go by that. Please don't go by that. That's uh, just a vague memory of mine. So I think I'm going to wrap up this uh, first live stream in a long time. Uh, it's first live stream where I've been interactive with the chat. Thank you, Ali Abbas, for um, ensuring that I got at least one question. <laughs> And thank you for the uh, 20 to 25 people who have been watching. I appreciate it very much. I'm going to try to repost this. Uh, if anyone can go over to my Twitter feed and give me some free advice as to how to uh, upload this and save it as a post, I would be most grateful to you. If anyone can give me tips on how to get rid of that, uh, evidently about a 20 second delay, I will also be grateful to you. Please um, like, share, and subscribe to my video channels. I desperately need your uh, contributions. I'm about to go under. Uh, if I disappear for a while, it's because I've simply run out of funds. I want to thank those of you from the bottom of my heart who have contributed and made this live stream possible. Please help me to grow it. Let's build a community and let's build a community that gets active and does things, does positive, legal, helpful things to spread information, to build community, to uh, rescue humanity from the Temple of Solomon and the worships, worshipers of the black cloud, the black rock, the uh, holy of holies of darkness, of evil. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. I'm signing off.